Please welcome to the stage, Dekel. Hey everyone, I'm excited to be here today. Uh, like so many of you, I wake up every morning, I go to my office and I just work on all of my day-to-day -day projects. So today it's a very unique opportunity for me to be able to share with you what my team and I have been building and have learned along the way. 70%, 70% of users in emerging markets say that before they install an app, they consider its size. 70%. For me, this is a mind-blowing fact because it's so different than what we all used to. So if I'm just looking around here and I'm thinking, all of us, did we ever check the size of an application before we decided we wanted to install and use that? Probably almost none of us. And this is what this talk is all about. At Facebook, we learned that app size is critical. So how exactly did we learn that? And what did we do about it? My name is Dekel Nahr, and I work at the Facebook Tel Aviv office, and I've been a part of the Facebook family for approximately five and a half years now. And I'm working on a product called Facebook Lite. So almost two billion people use Facebook almost every single day, but most of them just don't have what we have. So here at the Bay Area, we have the newest smartphones, we have infinite storage, we have access to the best networks available but actually most of our users don't have that. And this is why we built Facebook Lite. We had those people in mind, and we wanted everyone on every device everywhere to have the best experience possible. Prior to Facebook Lite, I worked on an initiative called internet.org. Internet.org is all about enabling everyone everywhere to be able to come online and connect to the internet and making sure that no matter where you are, people can connect to their communities and their families. And I'm also a racing driver, as you can see in the picture. And we'll come back to that later. <laughs> so what are we going to cover today? First, app size mattered. We learned that at Facebook. How exactly did we learn that? So we want to build light apps. How exactly do we do it? We're going to see several successful projects that we've built at Facebook in order to achieve that. And then we'll wrap it up. So, in the world of mobile applications, less is actually more. So by building light applications, we can achieve many benefits. First, let's start from the user perspective, user's perspective, and see the download experience. So downloading an application using it is one of the first encounters that people have with our applications. And the first impression really matters, and we want to make it the best possible. We can also use uh, driving more successful downloads as a growth lever for our application and actually be able to grow our platform by using that. We can get more people to use the latest versions of our applications that have all of the features that we work on. And eventually, we see very clear trends that people today look on uh, this, the footprint of their device, the available storage that they have, and they really appreciate that. So let's drill down. The experience is the key here. So imagine yourself. You're walking down the city, or you're just about to board a bus or a train to somewhere. The network might be a bit flaky or not everything working properly. And all you wanted is to install an application and start using that to achieve something. And this is a critical moment, because many of the users will try to install. If they will fail, they will not come back again. And this will be a poor experience. And on the other hand, if we can get it right, this is a very good user experience. Now let's see how we can use Delizer to actually drive more downloads. <coughs> so let's start with installation rates. Google did a research on all of the applications on Google Play, and they saw a very clear correlation. They actually saw that every time an application reduces six megabytes of its size, it can drive 1% of the installation ratio. Now this is a crazy number because we look on all of the time on how we can improve all of our flows just to drive 0.2 or 0.3% to 
to our application, but this is a whole 1% that is often overlooked, and we don't frequently do something about it. We, we did our testing as well. So at Facebook, we love A-B testing. We A-B test everything because we want to understand exactly how everything is affected when we drive changes. We want to make sure that the changes that we do actually drive more value for our users. And we, when we did our A-B testing, when we uh, reduced the size of one of our applications, we were able to see that every time we lose just five bytes, another user joins the platform. So five bytes is maybe the smallest thing that I can imagine, just addition of a string that says hello to the application. And even the slightest change is actually one user that will continue to use our platform later on. And this is amazing. This is why we understood it is so critical for us. I've started with users that actually see that before they install the application, before they start the funnel of the installation, they consider the size, whether it's because they, con they are concerned about the storage or the mobile network, but they look on the size of the application. And besides of that, we also have a limitation on Google Play. So it used to be like a hard threshold that if you go above 100 megabytes, you just can't upload the application to Google Play. Now it just limits the mobile network. So if our app gets larger than 100 megs, then we just can't download it on mobile network. We have to use Wi-Fi for that. And this is very limiting and very frustrating for our users. And it might sound like a lot 100 megs, but many applications reach that. We almost reach that. We see many other applications that actually cross that bar. And it's important for us to stay below that. Let's talk about updates. So, so far we did discuss downloads and installations for the first time, but it, only it also affects updates. So we basically have thousands of engineers at Facebook, and we do all of those market researches, trying to understand what are the most important features, and we heard all about it here in the conference. This is the new features that we drive. But actually when we look on that, just 60% of our users actually download our applications from the recent eight weeks or so. So basically we have this entire operation of building the best features available and doing it in the best av uh, available method, but nearly half of our users will not get it in the upcoming future. Moreover, when we do all of those tests on what does uh, the A-B test that allows us to see what's the value for our users, we will not see that for all of those users that never under updated so far. So this is important for us for that reason as well. And of course, the limitation of 100 megs also, also affects the update flow and not just the installation flow. When we looked on the update rates and we had reductions in our size that we created improvement in our application, we were able to reduce 10 megabytes in our size. And we saw that that drove 1 to 6%, 1 to 6% sorry, of our update rate. So this is a really big number because it allows many, many users to allow, to to actually use new features that we launch. And let's get to footprint. So the number one reason that we looked uh, on uninstalling Android application, we actually created servers among people that uninstall our applications. And the number one reason that came up for uninstalling was not lack of features, it was not about apps that crash, it was not even concern about security or privacy, it was just people that ran out of space. So they ran out of space. They wanted to shoot a photo or a video of their family. They didn't have any place on their device. So they just chose to uninstall something so we were able to do so. And when we looked at the data, we saw that it's actually very visible in the data. So once people have less than 200 megs available on their devices, they are more than double the likelihood, the likelihood to uninstall our applications more than doubles. And it can be the Facebook application, it can be any other application that you work on. But when people run out of storage, the first thing that we do is just uninstall applications. So we want to build lightweight applications because we understood that this is very important. But how do we even begin to do so? The first thing is that I want to convince you that it's actually possible. So this is the size of the Facebook for Android application over the last three years. So you can see that it used to be a very small application. It was only 40 megs. I know it's still more than double most of the applications, but it was a light application that had some limited amount of features. 
And then we wanted to come up with new video players and 360 videos and reactions and all of the new things that everyone enjoy in our applications. And our upsize grew to close to 100 megs, just above 90. And this is the point where we understood that we have to do something because if we're not acting about it soon, we will cross the 100 megs and more and more people will find it harder to uninstall our, to install our applications. And that's when we tried to, started working on that and we were actually available to reverse this, this trend. Now it was not always easy and you can see all of those spikes and movements. So it's quite complex and we had a lot more changes and new features coming. But overall, over time, we were able to reverse the, tr the trend and build lighter applications. As you heard yesterday, we, we are concerned about our upsize across all of our applications. It's WhatsApp, it's Messenger, and it's all of the rest of our applications. So we are trying to build uh, solutions that can help all of our applications, and hopefully also open source solutions that will help applications that, are not, that doesn't belong to Facebook so we can create lighter applications to all of our users. So how do we actually do it? How do we keep our apps light? The first thing that we start with is to actually decide that this is something that is important for us to achieve. We set it as a high priority and we set goals. We say that we want to reduce our size. Once we do that, it's easier for us to, to to look at all of the new features that we push in our applications, and we have systems in place to understand exactly what drives in increasement in size. And eventually, we also proactively look for opportunities to reduce our size and make our apps lighter. So let's start. The first thing that we do is we want to set goals so we know that we are on track, and we know that if we are not on track, we have to do something about it, and we have to work harder. So over the course of time, we had three types of goals. The first one was to limit our goals. We said, okay, this is our size now, and this is our size now, sorry, and we want, uh, and we understand that we are going to push new features in the next three or six months. So let's limit the size, let's have a quota of the size that we are willing to grow. And if we are going over that, then we will stop things. The second type of goal that we had is hold the line. What do we mean by that? So we have efforts to reduce our size and we have features that we are gonna push and are going to increase the size. And we are committing to balance the two. We will not go one byte over our current size at the beginning of the period. And eventually, when we, learn, when we learn how to do it better, we could also put reduced size goals, which says, okay, our size is now, let's say, 54 megs. By the end of this year, we want it to be 50 megs and not a byte more. And we are really committed to hit those goals. So let's understand how we do our defense efforts. How do we understand what actually increases our size? The first thing that we need to understand, it's, it's, it's an ROI, it's a return on investment. Eventually it's a trade-off. So every time we now look at the feature and we're going to ship a feature that is going to increase the size, we need to understand whether the size increase in the application to the users that are sensitive to it will be worth the value that we give to all of the users. So if you have a feature that might be very exciting but can serve a very limited amount of people, maybe we will just decide not to ship it and not to push it to all of the users in the world. And on the other hand, if we have something that has a slight increase in size but will drive a lot of value and all of the users enjoy it, we will for sure decide to ship it. And this is the discussion that we are now holding before pushing every feature to any, any one of our applications. So how do we actually know the size difference that a feature increases? That's why we have BuildBot in place. So as you may have heard so far, we love bots at Facebook. We have all kinds of bots and they do all kinds of things. And actually some of my best friends today are bots. They're really nice. So we have BuildBot in place. And what does BuildBot do? BuildBot takes the application and builds it off the source code. And just before we push a new change, we call it a diff. You can think of that as a pull request on GitHub. So before we push that change and we decide to merge it, we, put, we build it just after this change and we build the application and we look on all of the sections of the application and how were, were those affected. So we can see the DAX, which is the Java code basically, and we can see resources such as images, JSON and others. 
and we look on all of the sections that were affected and how exactly were those affected. And what that allows us is to say, okay, we have a new feature and it, it has a very big increase in size and we want to ship it because we know it has great value, but the greatest increase comes from images. So maybe we can settle for the, some of the images or change of our layouts or compress our images better or have all of these kind of solutions such as reusing a different infrastructure in order not to increase our size of code anymore. And this allows us to understand exactly where those increases come from and how we can address those. Except, so, except for those, we have SizeBot. So SizeBot is very, very similar. It uses biz, BuildBot, sorry. So every time an engineer at Facebook pushes code to production, we actually take this uh, BuildBot and we look on the increase and we say, did it cross a certain threshold? So let's say we now want to push a new change and we regress the size and say, okay, I know that changing the like icon to pink is the best thing that can happen to users. And you know that too. But this cost 450 something kilobytes. So now we can manage this discussion. Does 450 kilobytes worth the value of this change or not? And this allows us to have uh, the conversation, the discussion, just around the introduction of the new feature. And when we have these triggers that pop up, we take those really seriously, and we actually do this discussion every week. And now let's see how we can actually proactively reduce the size of our applications. So I know a thing or two about sports cars, and this is my favorite one. It's called the Lotus Super 7. So I worked for quite a while on reducing the size of our applications when I understood that actually building light apps and building light cars have a lot in common and similar approaches can be used. Colin Chapman was the founder of Lotus Motorsports back then in the 60s and he wanted to build this car and he wanted to have the best performance so he wanted to build it lightweight. And he said, simplify, then add lightness. And what did he mean by that? The first thing that we want to do is to simplify. We want to look at our features and say, do we actually need it? Do our users actually want that? And do we have to have that in place to achieve what we want? And this could be very various features that we decide to drop, whether it's a small feature or a big feature, and we are dropping things that we don't need. And he looked at the car back then that he wanted to, to build, and he said, doors? Why the heck do we need doors in a sports car or a rooftop? Just put on a hat and be on your way. And that's what he actually did, and that's what made this car so unique back at the time. And we did very similar things. And only after we do this first step of reducing everything we don't need, we go to look for more complex and more advanced technologies to reduce our size. So let's see how it's done. The first thing that we want to do is to have a breakdown. Because if we have 50 megabytes of an application, how do we know what we can drop? Ideally, we will have this kind of breakdown that says, okay, videos is uh, six megabytes and news feed is this megabyte and photos is that. So maybe we don't need photos, but we probably do. But when we go higher in resolution and we say, this kind of pictures, do we actually need to support it? What is the problem? It's quite hard to get to this kind of logical breakdown. So let's see how do we begin. The first thing that we usually do is to take Android Studio and throw at it the binary file, the APK file of the application. It allows us to identify the basic blocks. We can see the text, which is actual Java code. We can see resources, images, fonts, and all kinds of uh, different pieces of the application that our application is built off. And when we look on the actual classes.dex file, which is all of the compiled Java code, we can see a breakdown of how does it actually look? And we see all of the submodules that we have in the Facebook for Android application. But this is still very, very hard to work with because it brings us to a, to a situation where we identified the basic blocks, we saw the resources, but when we looked on the number of components, we saw dozens of components that have mutual dependencies and have a lot, of common, a lot in common, and they share pieces of code so how can we actually distinguish what is the footprint of the video support? And for that, we came with a methodology. Methodology, sorry. The first thing that we do 
is to identify the basic blocks, such as the resources, the images, the JSON files, and everything that we have. And then we come up with suspects, with an hypothesis. And we say, OK, this new 3D picture support, it must be very heavy because the way we implemented it. So how can we check exactly what is the footprint of that? For that, we just modify our code, and we strip it out. And we use BuildBot that we saw before to build both changes, before and after stripping it out. And then we can actually have the basis of the application of everything except for this 3D picture support, and the application with everything, and we can actually check the delta, the difference between those two. And this allows us to actually come back to the breakdown of, and, and put another piece in the puzzle of what does our application actually consist of. And with that in mind, let's see how did we actually able to reduce size. And let's start with Redex. Redex is an open source solution uh, by Facebook that actually takes an application, it takes a DEX file or sometimes an APK file, a built Android application, and it does improvement and optimizations. Now, if you ever tried to reduce app size, you're probably already familiar with ProGuard. ProGuard is a very widely uh, used tool that basically everyone that builds light Android apps uses to strip things of the application. And it's a very smart optimizer. It looks on the Java code and it says, OK, this is unused, and those classes are unused, and those methods are unused. And we can also join those methods together. And it's very smart, so it reduces a lot in the size. The thing about ProGuard is that it's a generic optimizer that intended for Java code. So it can work on your Java servers, and it can work on the Android applications. And that's why we introduced Redex, because Redex is dedicated for Android. It understands the actual bytecode that runs on Android, and it understands the actual structure that we have on Android and usage of resources and everything else in Android. And we don't recommend substituting ProGuard with Redex. We actually use them both, one after another, because together they can achieve very, very strong results. So let's see what we actually achieved with Redex. We were able to improve all of our runtime by 25% as a result of all of the improvements that, that it's done. And we were also able to improve 40% of the size of our application by running the, the Redex optimizer. And this is a very big difference because it's not even reducing anything in the functionality. It's fully complete as the app was before the Redex. As I mentioned, Redex is open source. You can see it on GitHub, you can fork, and you can use it. Every quarter, we launch an update, and we will see in features that we introduced soon. There is a Gradle plugin that was built to work with Redex, because we at Facebook, we usually work with back to build. And eventually, we welcome pull request. We want all of you to enjoy Redex and use it, and we also want you to contribute the great ideas that you have. So how do you get started with Redex? It's actually very simple. We created a very uh, easy default configuration that can work for any Android application. So you can basically just download it, use it, and use the default configuration, which is a simple and easy to use uh, JSON file. After we, after we do that, then we can have a lot of uh, advanced phases that sometimes have mutual dependencies and can fit more scenarios more than others. We have a documentation that is hopefully good enough to use. And we can use all of the different steps to try to understand what we can do better to optimize it to your application. But this is a good place to start with and just work with the default and then iterate on that. Download on demand resources. So not all resources are born equal. If I'm going back to the example of I'm just about to board a bus and go somewhere and I know my network is flaky, I wouldn't imagine downloading a Facebook application and not being able to react to some stories. But not all kind of resources are that critical. For example, we also have audio files. So every time you like a story, if you're ever not on silent mode on your phone, and you click like, you hear something like, click. And every time you have a comment, and you write a comment and you post it, it has something like, to do. And I know this is a critical moment, and you have to hear that, otherwise you don't enjoy the application. And I know this is a perfect reproduction of the sound. But you don't have to have that. Now, don't get me wrong. This is part of what makes our apps amazing and, make it, and makes people enjoy usage of the application. 
But it's not critical that at the same moment that you're downloading your application at the first time, you will have to have that. And this is what we understood, and this is what we actually uh, built download, uh, downloadable resources that can be downloaded after you already installed the application and after you already start using that. Now, it has many benefits. The first is that it's out of the critical chain in this critical moment that we have for someone to, to install our application and start using it. It also doesn't have to have any updates. So today, Google Play also optimizes updates of resources, but other stores or people that just share applications, as we see in emerging markets, they don't have that. So every time they run an update, they actually download all of the resources again. And downloading a resource once is just enough. We don't need to download it again and again and again. It's also dynamic and backward compatible. So if tomorrow we understand that there is a better click sound for like that is much, much better and more engaging, then we can just launch it and offer all of our users to download that without requiring them to use the latest application that we already seen that many people don't get. And eventually, since we control the, the download channel, then we can apply the best compression available for this kind of resource to make it as light as possible over the mobile data. Now let's switch to a project called Lean Crash Report. Now, I'm very excited about this project because I worked about it approximately a year of my life, and it's really powerful. So let's understand what are crash reports anyways. Every time an app crashes, then we get a report for the engineers to handle the crash. Because every time an app crashes, this is a poor experience for our users, and we want to improve that. And typically, what we see in crash reports is some kind of metadata, like the device that, uh, that it happened on or the user that it happened to. And we also see stack traces, which are the stacks of where was the call that actually created the exception that was thrown. So let's see a bit more about stack traces and how do those work. Let's say for the sake of example that I want to throw an F8 exception, and I know it's an original name, I thought of that myself, and when we throw it, we throw it somewhere in our code, and we propagate that. Now, if an exception is being catched and everything is all right and the, the flow continues, but if it was not and it was handled, it will cause the app to crash. Now, now we need to pay attention that basically we expect a few, piece, a few key components to be here. We expect our stack traces to tell us on which class did it happen, on which method exactly did it happen, and it also tells us the exact Java file that originated this code and the line of code. And we are used to use that because it's really useful and it's really easy for us engineers to understand what went wrong. And when I looked at that, I said, wait, how does it actually happen? Because I know that I used ProGuard and I know that I used Redux and I know both of them changed the names of methods and classes. So it can't be that the original name made it into the final application that we ship to our users. And what turned out is that actually, we see that Android has several phases. At the first one, it scans all of the addresses that, called to, uh, that yielded this call. And it takes the addresses and it takes the offsites that inside the methods. And only after, it enriches that with the data. And this data comes, comes from a section called APK debug info that has the debug info for all of the code. And what was amazing to see that it was actually 15% of our size. Now, we can look on other applications, sorry, and, and extrapolate that. And then we understand that actually 15% of all of the code size, of all of the Android applications that you know, is just this debug information intended for crashes. And then we said, if this opportunity is so large, maybe we can do something else to achieve that. Maybe we can take the raw representation, upload it to our cloud, and then use it after to enrich it back as Android would have done. And this is exactly what we have done. We took Redux, that as I said is open source, and therefore it's easy to use for everyone. And we took this debug information and we stripped it out of our application. We took the mapping and we saved it to the cloud. And we took the application and shipped it, sorry, without this information. So after we stored it to the cloud, it's available for us to use for later time. 
And when we ship the application, it's smaller by 15%. And then, when a crash happens, we take our crash reporter and it collects the raw stack tracing. And after that, in our cloud, it enriches back the information that we had and it reverts it back so the engineers that are handling the crashes or the exceptions that we've seen, they don't even have to know that it was one stripped and enriched back later. And then we tried, I worked on Facebook Lite, so we tried it on Facebook Lite, and so what can we achieve by that? And the result was that it worked perfectly and it reduced our total upsize by a full 11%, which is a very big win for us. And after we shipped it to Facebook Lite, we started testing on all of the rest of our applications. So we are now integrating it to our Facebook application, to Messenger, WhatsApp, Instagram, and to other applications as well. Because we want those solutions to great, make, greatest, make great experience across all of our applications. And hopefully, open source and everyone can use it as well. Now this kind of win has also a side effect that we call bending the curve. And what do we mean by that? I discussed, I discussed earlier on the trade-off that every time we ship a new feature, we say, does it bring enough value that, uh, that, uh, may, that justifies the size penalty? But now, actually, our code is smaller by 15%. So every, every time we hold this discussion now, we can actually say, now we play, wait less, so we can drive more value and more features to our users at the same cost. And with that, I'd like to wrap up. We saw that we have many benefits to build light applications. We saw that we can create a great user experience by that. We can grow our platform and the usage of our applications. We can bring more, more users to use our latest applications, our up-to-date versions, and we saw that people are likely to continue to use our application if we maintain a low footprint. We saw the methodology that we came with. Uh, to make our apps light. We start by prioritizing that. We understand everything that goes into our applications from now on. And we also have teams that proactively look for opportunities to reduce our size. And I'd like to finish with this chart because it gives me a, a reflection moment for all of the time that we worked on that and that we were able to come up with a sea trend that is worrying for us. And with putting our mind to it and focusing on that and executing on that, we were able to reverse this trend. And with that, I'd like to thank you. I'll be here next by uh, questions if anyone wants to come by. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>